you again on this journey through Acts where we're looking at some of the principles and practices of the early church that we might learn lessons and see how they operated so that we too might be a growing church. We began in chapter one with Jesus's great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit, which he gave in chapter two. And then when we came to chapter three, we realized that if God was at work, so too was the kingdom of darkness. And as opposition came, first of all, there was the external opposition in the face of persecution. Then we had internal opposition with corruption within the church. But by the power of God, all these were overcome and the church continued to grow and grow rapidly. But when we come to chapter six today, we notice that there's another type of opposition. And this is subtle Satan. It's the opposition of distraction. If Satan can distract the disciples from preaching the gospel, he's achieved his aim. The kingdom of God won't grow. And so he sets about distracting them. And this distraction came about through acts of kindness. In the church, they took up a weekly offering to care for the poor and particularly the widows in the church. And they distributed it. And to understand why the dispute arose, we have to realize that the church in Jerusalem at that time was a bilingual church. There were two language groups. First of all, there were the locals with the Aramaic speaking Christians, but then there were those who have a Greek background and came from various places around the Roman Empire, Jews, but they got converted and they were the Hellenistic or Greek speaking Jews. And what had happened was that the Leaders were all Aramaic speaking, and it was the Greek speaking widows who felt that they were not getting as much as the Aramaic speaking widows. They perceived, whether it happened or not, but it was a problem, an issue, they weren't getting all the food. And so a dispute arose amongst the Hellenistic the Greek-speaking Jews. I suppose in Wales, the way to understand it is that if we had a church here which was bilingual, all the leaders were Welsh-speaking and half the congregation was Welsh and half English, it would be the English-speaking people who would complain that they weren't getting uh, the service that the Welsh were getting and so it needed to be sorted out. So what happened? Well, first of all, four things. They recognize the problem. It's no uh, um, slight or, or no insult to realize that problems do arise. And it's no good sweeping them under the carpet because that's exactly what Satan wants, to disrupt the work of the church. And so the leadership recognized that there was a problem. It was C.S. Lewis who said the devil's greatest trick is to make you believe he doesn't exist. And if we don't believe there are issues, then he's won. And so they acknowledged the problem, obviously prayed about it and asked God what the solution was. And the solution was simply the principle on which they were going to work was this, that they would not uh, stop continuing preaching the gospel. The fundamental was that they were to preach the gospel and nothing must distract them from that, to lead the church to preach the gospel. And nothing, however worthwhile it was, they weren't going to do it. So the third solution, was to distribute the work, to choose people who had the gift to do the work. And so they chose seven men 
and what we can make out was that they were perhaps Greek-speaking uh, Jews who got converted, and they chose them. And that's the principle of the church, that it's a body ministry, that we all have to work together and use our gifts. And whatever gifts we've got, God wants to use them for his glory. And no one gift is better than the other. The problem in our day and age is that we live in a celebrity culture where certain individuals are put on a pedestal. And it's very often the preachers and the people out the front that seem important, the ones preaching the word. But actually, in the body of Christ, we're all one. And no gift is greater than the other. And the apostles were very uh, clear on this, that sharing the work was all the work of God. It wasn't a lesser task. It was as important a task as anything. And so when we work in the church, we're all doing God's work, some more prominent than others, but the work is nevertheless no more important. And so the fourth principle in which they operated, they said these have to be godly men. These have to be spiritual men filled with the Holy Spirit and the power. They have a heart for the work because the work of the church isn't like a committee whereby you just pick somebody who can do it. And it can't be like a cold, calculated way of just doing a job. This is working for the kingdom of God. It's using our gifts and using them for his glory. And the key was that they had a heart for the work, they had a love for Jesus, and they're filled with his power and spirit. And that's the principle on which people should work, his people in the church today. And the result? Well, Dr. Luke tells us very simply that the church increased rapidly. It was a dramatic increase when the issue was sorted out and people were working and sharing their gift and working together, the church grew. And that is what happened after that. Now Dr. Luke focuses on individuals and the spread of the gospel. But first of all, he adds a little statement. And many priests were converted to the faith. And you think, what's that got to do with it? What's the relevance of that? Well, it concerns the first man that he talks about, Stephen, the very first Christian martyr. Stephen was the first of the named deacons, and he was a Greek-speaking Jew. And in his evangelism, he took up discussing this with Greek-speaking Jews. He shared his faith with Greek-speaking Jews. Many of them were great believers in the temple, and they had studied the Old Testament, and Stephen began to talk to them. And that's where the problems began, because they tried to talk to Stephen and win an argument but they couldn't. Stephen was a very courageous man, very direct and filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the truth and they just couldn't handle it. It's fascinating, isn't it, how disputes arise. First of all, people talk and disagree. And then that turns when somebody doesn't win the argument to insults and the insults fly. And then thirdly, it turns from insults to violence. That's how all little fights and disputes begin and often end up. It's actually how wars begin when uh, jaw jaw finishes and it's war war. It works in that principle. And that's what happened here with Stephen. Stephen was disputing with the Hellenists. He was telling them about the Old Testament and they knew the Old Testament. Well, they thought they did. 
They read it. They knew their history. He began with Abraham and told them all that God was doing, that God was planning the future and God was going to not only make a people, but ultimately send a Messiah called Jesus into the world. Yes, that they would worship in the temple, but one day the temple would give way to the person of Jesus, the living Lord Jesus. And as he spoke to them, they said that his face looked like the face of an angel. It was radiant. It was full of the Holy Spirit. And that reminded them that Moses, when he came down from the mountain, his face was radiant. And they didn't like that because they could see that it was God in them. God was in Stephen and his argument that Jesus is the Messiah, the promised one of the Old Testament. They didn't want to know. And ultimately, Stephen described them as stiff necked. And that's how God had described his people in the Old Testament, stiff necked. And they were infuriated by that as he began to preach and tell them the story. They couldn't answer it. And so it became after arguments, insults, and they accused him of blasphemy. But they knew the truth and they couldn't argue with him. So they made up charges. This was deja vu. This was exactly what they did with Jesus. They took false accusations and accused him of blasphemy, of speaking against the temple, of speaking against the Old Testament because it didn't marry with their view. But as Stephen said, you are a stiff necked people. You refuse to believe. Satan has blinded your eyes. God is the living God who spoke in the Old Testament and promised Jesus to come and be the resurrection and the life and to change our lives, to live, to die for our sins. Not in the temple anymore. Jesus is the living sacrifice and rose again on the third day. They didn't like it at all. And when they lost the argument, they turned to violence and it was a mob. They dragged him before the council and as he spoke to them, they became even more angry and they took, grabbed him. You see, the council that they had, had no authority to execute anybody. And last time they were in this position, it was Jesus and they handed him over to the Romans. And that was a real struggle to get him ex um, executed. So what did they do this time? It was mob violence. They didn't like Stephen. They took him out and they executed him. They stoned him to death simply for believing in Jesus. And that raises all sorts of questions, particularly why should God allow that? When he was the God who could get people out of prison, he was the God of the resurrection. Why did Stephen die? Well, the text and history gives us an answer. We don't understand it, but we can see the results. In January 1956, five American missionaries flew from their base in Ecuador into the jungle to reach a tribe of Indians called the Aukards, or they're now known as Wayani. And these were an unreached. The only contact they'd had with people was oil workers and they had killed some of them. But they felt called of God to go and preach the gospel to them. And so they flew in their plane, they circled it, they built it, tried to build up a friendship and ended up on the beach, but not far from their camp. And they stayed there for five days. And during that time, they met some of the locals, gave them gifts, and they tried to make up friendship. And then after five days, 
suddenly, out of the jungle, the Wayani people appeared with their eight-foot spears and speared the five young men to death. The whole world was shocked by such an event. Why should these young men go? Why should they even die? Why should God allow it? Well, we don't have the answer. But we know what happened after that. There were thousands of people who felt called to the mission field. And also many of the missionaries who went there managed to reach these Uwayani people and the people who used the spears became Christians. This is a picture of Steve Saint, the son of the pilot, with the very man who killed his father with his eight foot spear. Many of the tribe were converted later on and the church was established. Evidence that the gospel can change lives and no longer do they go around killing people. They try to save lives by sharing their faith in Jesus. I experienced the effect of that myself when in the 1970s, my first mission trip was to the jungles of Peru to help the missionaries do dentistry and to do dentistry with these various tribes to teach them how to do dentistry basic in the, with what they had. And the boat and the expedition was led by none other than Bert Elliott, who was the brother of Jim Elliott, the leader of the five. And the, I saw for myself, the church is thriving in that community. And so too in Acts, when Stephen died, what happened was the church spread. There was persecution in Jerusalem and the church spread, but it spread and grew. And the gospel went into all sorts of areas and the numbers grew. That is exactly what happens when the church comes together and knows the power of God it grew. But also one other effect was the way Stephen died. We'll see that when we come to the life of the apostle Paul. But the immediate effect was this. He looked up to heaven as he was dying. And he said to the uh, Hellenistic Jews, I see the Son of Man standing in heaven. They were infuriated by that because he was referring to the book of Daniel. And there Daniel describes the Son of Man standing in judgment on the nations of the world. Though that have rejected God and Stephen was applying that to these Jews. No wonder they were incensed and stiff-necked and angry. They saw that God was standing in judgment on them, which is true because they didn't believe in the resurrection and believe in Jesus. Jesus was standing in heaven and he relayed that. But Jesus was standing for another reason. He was standing ready to receive his servant, Stephen. Stephen had been faithful and Jesus was in heaven waiting to receive him and to usher those words. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Luke doesn't tell us about the people that were converted during his lifetime just tells us the works that he did, but the, he tells us what happened after his death. Many, many people were converted. Why? Because he was faithful in life. 
and faithful in death. And the challenge of Acts and Stephen's death to each one of us is how faithful are we? Willing to serve our Lord and the cost? What are we prepared to do for Jesus? How much does Jesus mean to us? Like the five missionaries who said, what is it that I should give my life that I can easily lose to gain that which I cannot lose, eternal life in Jesus? And so we're challenged by reading those stories and by listening to Stephen speak to us. What will our reward be? Will we have that reward and that welcome when Jesus could say to each one of us, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into your eternal rest. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the example of Stephen and for others who have given their life for the gospel. Lord, by the power of your Spirit, challenge us to our real commitment to you. And Lord, we pray that as you challenge us, make us aware of the gifts that you've given us, that we might use those gifts for your glory, the extension of the kingdom. We might be aware of the evil one, but overcome in the name and power of the living Lord Jesus to glorify you and to share our faith so that the church would grow, would be strong in you. Lord, pour out your spirit upon us that we may be your servants for Christ's sake. Amen.